Hello, is Mike on Itegeka here? I don't see him sign in unless he's using a different gadget. Um, he says five minutes uh, of winding up. Uh, this event is uh, alive is live on Facebook. Um, a majority of our participants are probably going to be there. Um, so we need to be able to start um, uh, fairly quickly uh, so that people simply don't wait. Um, I think that what I'll do is that we will um, go ahead and start the event um, and uh, Michael should be able to join us um, in about five minutes. So, good morning, everyone, again. Um, my name is Rose Clark Nanyonga. I am the Vice Chancellor for Clark International University, and I am delighted to be here and to moderate and host a panel of outstanding uh, scholars and administrators who have been instrumental in helping us roll out uh, the open distance and uh, e-learning program at CIU, some of whom have been doing this work well before Odell actually started. Um, CIU is not new to online learning, we have been doing online learning for some approved graduate, graduate programs uh, since 2008. And we have been able to leverage some of that experience uh, with our deans and teaching faculty to inform new ways of working, new ways of teaching, new ways of learning for our students who are now uh, learning online. So I want to thank you all for uh, joining us uh, here on Zoom and for those who are on Facebook Live. I want to take an opportunity to introduce our panelists to you uh, so that you know who is talking to you this morning. I'll start with the uh, folks at uh, Clark International University, uh, Professor John Charles Okiria is the Dean of the Institute of Allied Health Sciences, has been working uh, with Clark International University for over 10 years. He is also the chair of the Allied Health Professionals Council, uh, which is in charge of uh, a lot of healthcare providers, including clinical uh, medicine um, uh, clinicians, uh, recently public health are now being uh, registered under allied health, uh, pharmacists, uh, laboratory technicians, and so on. And that means that he is really responsible for uh, training a lot of healthcare providers in this new normal, both in the classroom setting as well as the continuing medical education for the practitioners in the field who are on the front line. The next panelist is Dean John Bosco Alege, who has been working for Clark International University again for almost 10 years. He is the Dean of the Institute of Public Health and Management. And he is uh, also the Dean who has been running the longest e-learning program at CIU for two graduate programs that were approved nearly 10 years ago. So he brings a lot of experience to this conversation. The next panelist is Mr. Michael Nitegeka, the director of the refactory program, one of our most successful uh, program right now under the School of Business and Applied Technology. Michael brings a great deal of experience and expertise in e-learning 
And in fact, when universities shut down, the program he runs just shifted online and he was able to do that efficiently. So um, Michael, you, you are welcome and we look forward to hearing about the experience you've had with the refactory and how CIU can leverage some of that going forward to make things better for our students in the general university. Lastly, I want to introduce Mr. Sean Clark, who is the CEO of Clark Group Education and also the director of Clark Junior School. So he has uh, had to uh, <laughs> look after two entities in terms of continuity. How does the university continue uh, to learn and teach online but also how can primary schools um, utilize a technology and digital learning to reach children? And they've had some really amazing, interesting programs, both on TV and online. And it will be really good to hear some of those experiences. Ladies and gentlemen, these are experienced panelists. We are delighted to have them. Uh, to speak to us today. When uh, COVID happened, many of us wondered what universities would do. And in fact, the first presidential order was to shut the universities down. And we all had to then ask the question that everybody has asked, what happens to the learners? What happens to the teaching faculty? How do we move forward? Although it took us a while to get uh, approval to start teaching online, the government did rapidly uh, engage strategically to foster a way forward and several universities have been approved to teach online, Clark International University being one of them. Today's dialogue is about what we are learning what we are doing well, and how other institutions can borrow a leaf from what has worked at Clark International University. I will start uh, the conversation, therefore, by asking uh, um, Dean uh, John Bosco Alege to tell us a little bit about readiness, because in um, getting the university ready to teach online, the National Council has a list of checklists and the check boxes that we must meet. So I would like to know in terms of readiness, what is it that we have done at CIU that has worked uh, to get us to a level where we were ready to roll out Odell. So we will jump right in and start with Dean John Bosco Alege. Dean John Bosco. Thank you, Dr. Rose, our host and moderator uh, this morning for yet uh, an interesting conversation in regards to online learning or what is commonly uh, customized as Odell. So when the president addressed the nation and uh, the decision was made that uh, universities would close. Initially, we thought we were going for a week, a month or two. Up until today, <laughs> we are still under a lockdown. So in terms of readiness as a university, one thing that, so a couple of things happened, but starting with first things first, we already had a system of online learning called, uh, we used to call it Moodle, where two of our successful programs, the Master of Science in Public Health and the Master of Science in Health Services Management, were already uh, pivoted on that platform. And so for us, um, it was like, at least we had a point to start from. But one thing that I remember very well is that for a very long time, since 2008, so many people, stakeholders challenged us how do you run a program for two years online and the student graduates without being physically at CIO? And so we kept responding to those questions and, and we were comfortable because we knew what we were doing. The brand was happy with the service, with the product. 
And so when this time when COVID came in and uh, we were given the directive to close, we had to immediately re-strategize and start building on you know, the little that we had in terms of Moodle to move forward. But for the most part, to me, it was more of uh, change management in terms of uh, mindset, you know? So everyone was thrown into panic, students, teaching faculty, administrators. So we had to start by making some very critical and tough decisions in terms of how do we move forward? I have an opportunity to facilitate under Michael as the team leader for the refactory program. I remember one of the questions Michael asked was, you guys, are we going home like the rest or we have to move forward? And I think we had a very fruitful discussion in terms of we need to move forward. And so um, what we did then was to quickly respond to the National Council for Higher Education requirements and start ticking the boxes. So do you have a platform? Yes, we do. Do you have the minimum infrastructure? Yes, we do. And so we continued on and on and on. So that was in terms of the physical infrastructure. Now there's the software in terms of the mindset. So what quickly we did, what we did quickly to, to, to regroup was to make sure that one, staff were oriented to understand that with this is a new normal, learning has to continue, whether um, remotely or blended. Secondly, we also had to orient our students to understand that it is possible and it can happen. And we actually made reference to our students who graduated purely by enrolling on the remote program. And so after doing the mindset, then we had now to uh, start actual training, you know, giving, making sure that our teaching faculty have the basic, the minimum a bare competences to be able to facilitate online teaching. As many of you will appreciate, uh, it's a new thing for many people, learning online where you're not meeting physically, the contacts and all that. And so we had to quickly turn around and train our facilitators to be able, first of all, to write content, upload content, and make sure that the interface is feasible enough for a student to be able to follow instructions on the platform. And the next thing then was, I think we are for most part at 80% in terms of the software, in terms of the physical infrastructure, in terms of the attitude, and uh, we are moving forward. Thank you very much, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Dean John Boscoalege. Um, I think it's really interesting when you say orienting uh, uh, faculty and students to a new normal. Um, I think that in so many ways, there are some lingering feelings that, you know, this new normal is going to go away. <laughs> and uh, very soon uh, we will probably, you know, go back to, to what it used to be. Um, I think it's important really for, um, this, is a, this is a great opportunity. COVID is probably the worst thing that has happened to the world. Um, and yet, uh, yesterday I was listening to a young lady who said, and this is so cliche, that you know, when you are given some lemons, you know, you can either do nothing with them or you can make lemon juice. And I think that institutions uh, needed to explore what opportunities are available. How do we reorient and reorient to this new normal? Let's move to Sean Clark, uh, because I know that Mr. Clark. Uh, also did his MBA from an outstanding university online. Um, I know that motivation is really important and e-learning requires strong self-motivation for both students and faculty. Um, Mr. Sean, what can we do to really continue to motivate faculty, to motivate students, Speaking from the experience that you have had yourself as an e-learning student and you competently were able to accomplish your studies online, what can you say to people who just feel, as we often say, demotivated with this new e-learning? Thank you, Dr. Rose. Um, yeah, I... I uh did an MBA with the University of Liverpool um, four or five years ago. I can't remember when. 
exactly now, but um, that was long before COVID. It was it was a choice for me to study online, and uh, the reason I did that was is that I could fit around my full time job. Um, do what I wanted. Um, it's extremely flexible. I was in impact people in the world. Um, here and there, um, the different cultural perspectives. And that in itself is extremely valuable. Um, and uh, yeah, there's an awful lot I enjoyed about it. Um, I like to write, and uh, the um, program very much lied on Sean? discussing. Sean? Hello? Uh, can, can you kill your video so that we can hear you better? You have a significant okay. lag on the All line. Right. Mm, thank you. I hope that'll be better. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so there's an awful lot of advantages um, to online learning um, because of the flexibility that it offers. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think that there are good opportunities to say um, with with operating remotely, um, and it's it is, it is embrace. I think that some of the problems uh, are orientated around the, the uh, preconception of what education should be like. And that um, teaching is something that is done by the teacher, the lecturer, and, and absorbed learning sort of happens there uh, by, by the, the student, uh, as opposed to other pr perspectives of, of learning. And as a result, we really consider teaching to be something that's didactic, that's chalk and talk. The teacher stands at the front with the chalkboard, talks and writes in the student absorbs. Um, if, we to, if we were to reassess that and look at learning as a co-creation of value and, a, and, a, and a, something which involves uh, a team getting together and, and really helping each other to learn and, and learning being facilitated by a lecturer or a teacher, um, then that perspective allows us to look at online learning with, with, with great opportunity. Um, there is, there's opportunities uh, in online learning, for example, with, with uh, utilizing multimedia. You, our, our teachers um, un, being unable to stand in front of a classroom, they are now directing students to um, YouTube videos, educational YouTube videos and so forth. Um, that actually potentially do a better job of explaining using diagrams and using animation and so so forth that, that, that can really help all types of learners. Um, so I, I think that, um, yeah, in, in terms of online learning and the advantages that it has, uh, they're, they're substantial. Of course, our drawback as well, um, but it, it, uh, we, if we focus on the positive, it's really, it's really a great thing. And I think that's, that is what is going to motivate students, is if we bring out the advantages that are inherent in uh, e-learning and, and the opportunities to do so using the internet. Um, in terms of motivating faculty, if you, to motivate faculty, they really have to know what they're doing. No, no one enjoys doing, working when they, when they don't feel they're good at it. <laughs> People need to feel that they're good at their jobs and good at their work. So uh, really it, it's about support. It's about ensuring that they have the, the technical support that they have and they have the emotional and team support. Um, and then the encouragement um, where, where we can encourage people we need to be um, Yeah. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, later on, I would like you to um, expound a little more about how that then translates at the level of the primary school uh, that you are running and some of the best practices uh, that you have been able to develop there at Cloud Junior School. But now I would like uh, to move on um, to our next uh, panelist. Um, Mr. Michael uh, Neitegeka, e-learning requires strong online communication and skills for both faculty and students. And I remember having a conversation with you where you said we need to be able to humanize this experience. 
can you talk a little bit about how this can be achieved or how this has been achieved in one of our programs at the refactory? Michael? Thank you, Dr. Rose. Uh, yes, so one of the things that we quickly learned when we started, when we went online, was the way we were really now speaking to machines. Uh, when everybody turns their, their videos off and all you see is, is a name, and if you're very lucky, they have a, a picture. Um, and, and so you, you're just talking. And, and so the, the intentional, one of the things we did was to create sessions that allowed people to come and meet, allowing, following the standard operating procedure so that I'm able to know Dr. Rose from not just an image on, the, on my PC every single day, but I can tell Rose from a human being but also for them to get to meet their facilitators, to get to meet their coaches. And the excitement that happened in that meeting was, was, was electrifying uh, for the students to get to know, uh, this is how you actually look, uh, I used to see you. So, so that was one thing that we did. The second thing that we did um, rather fast was to realize that uh, the students and the facilitators, we, we had a debrief on Wednesday with the facilitators. And, and one of the things that came out was the first cohort, we all struggled. We struggled with the emotional distress. You're, you're talking to yourself, you're struggling alone. The second cohort, we all are reporting back positive vibes. The class was very enlightened, was quite encouraging. And there was a lot of energy in the class as opposed to the first cohort. And so we asked the question, so what could have happened differently this time round that didn't happen the other time? It was the level of preparation on both the facilitators, but also on the learners, because the learners knew that the cohort was purely online. But also as facilitators, we prepared much better. Um, I was listening to some of the examples where facilitators would play music for the first 15 minutes before the class begins. And the students enjoyed that. I, I had facilitators who had uh, games and jokes that, that, that allowed students to join. So by the time the session begins, the first 15 minutes, so they would log on at let's say 10.45, the class is beginning at 11. But by 10.50, you have the entire class and they are coming in for the non-technical stuff. They're coming for this, what you call the appetizer, if I could put it that way. So, so that way, we were able to see people coming to life. And, and it was not just the dead computer that you're facing, just the screen that you're facing. Uh, some that could turn on their, their cameras and show some dance strokes, and, and, and if I could put it that way. So, so the essence, and, and we are still learning, if I could, if, if, if that makes sense, because you realize that um, because it is evolving and, and it's a very dynamic space, um, that very quickly you need to keep changing. So, so, so that's how I can put it, Dr. Rose. That's how we've managed to humanize it. But we have also kept in touch with the students trying to find out what is working, what is not working. And guess what? We created a link for the students for their discussions. And on, on Wednesday, I was told that if you logged on at 2 a.m., you'd find students discussing. 2 a.m., students would be discussing. Uh, so, so, so they took the initiative, they owned it, and, and they're managing it. Um, so we're looking forward to the next cohort, but that's, that's what I could share for now. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I like the icebreakers, uh, being able to humanize that um, I think creating communities within communities online uh, is really important for students to feel that they are connected to each other, but that they are also connecting with the teaching faculty, because that is essentially what makes and enriches the experience of learning uh, in the face-to-face -face traditional uh, model. Um, once again, I want to uh, say hello to our Facebook Live 
um, who are on nearly about 300 people are following this conversation uh, on Facebook. Uh, please welcome. Um, but now I want to really move on to uh, Professor Kidia. He has a difficult task of training science, health science students. And there are a lot of controversial uh, conversations about how do you teach these things online? You know, are students really learning? Um, professor, online instructors tend to focus on theory rather than practice. And yet, for majority of our students as a health sciences entity, require a component of practicums, you know, simulations, and so on and so forth. How are we able to actually do this and do it well? Professor Kilia, you're up. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, uh, my colleagues, the moderators. Let me just begin with the, the normally the hidden story about training clinicians. Uh, COVID has come and probably sincere position that professionals and clinicians thought that probably no training can be done online as regards clinical training is concerned. But uh, I have had opportunity being the chair of council that uh, supervises 36 different cadres. I have had private meetings with the people and I have shared with them the experience of CIU and how it works. Just for fun, somebody told me, how will I then punish these clinicians who come late to class? I had got used to making them stand the whole lecture. I had got used to making them scrub. Now you people, how will these people learn discipline? I had got to make, used to make, use them scrub the toilets. And so where do I then have this whole body building of a clinician? If the person is going to be out there and he cannot take my orders, he cannot take my instructions. How can I be sure this is going to be an obedient man? And that's the ideology that is in us. In some nursing training institutions, most of you are aware there is even caning. How do I cane these errant nurses to put them to shape to know that they are really professionals? This is a missed opportunity for the vice because you probably was expecting to continue with the vice forever. But what am I saying? The online teaching, as far as clinical settings concerned, CIU should be highly applauded for the, the blended approach that you have had. Like my Dean colleague, Dean Jones put it, there was a very serious and attitudinal thing, more so in the health sector, that you can never be able to train uh, a competent as professional using online training. And yet actually on observation, we actually found that more than 60% of the course unit content needed just theoretical training and the students then need to catch up with the other part, which CIU has developed a blended approach. As we talk now, we have our students on placement and what the institution decided to do before they entered for placement, they all screened for COVID-19 and they got satisfied. And the placement is ending. They have been in the wards. And part of the learning that CIU emphasizes is that COVID is that one condition that the student must practically learn how to prevent, control, and manage. So there was no denial for the learners to go on hands-on training. So we have students in the Kayungo Hospital, we have students in Kawal Hospital, we have students in the Mubendi Hospital, where probably a number of these cases have gone. But because of the approach and the training and the reassurance and the skills that they were given them before going for placement, we have had a successful placement in the care. After all, even previously, they were actually going and treating patients with different conditions, some of which they did not even know. So they had 
verse exposure, but here is a condition, one of the thousands, which we had the opportunity to prepare. So the team at CIA, you prepare these learners on the challenge that is currently on and be able to understand that they want to be able to learn about management of COVID from theory, but management of COVID at the site where COVID cases are. We have actually had the opportunity to think, how about now the practical demonstrations, the simulations? Many institutions do not have simulators, but what we know that many institutions have skills lab and CIE is privileged to have one of the very, very modern skills lab uh, for uh, laboratory and clinical medicine nursing. And so what CIU has done for now is that as the students continue with their theory classes, we are going, we have put them in small cohorts that are manageable, that can observe the SOPs that fit into our skills labs. And the small cohorts will at time be invited to come and do their demonstrations. And we're actually even going to have an open tent out where the models that we have are going to be brought outside in the tent for the purposes of demonstrations by the clinicians on the learners in small cohorts that are the higher to the COVID requirements of um, the standard operating procedures. So what does this mean? That quality learning continues. What does this mean? We are able to have the students take classes online. And one of the successful stories, though not 100%, but building has been the acceptance of the learners to be able to take online classes for theory classes after placement hours. I probably want to confess that currently to CIU, that has this model on, where students have agreed that they can have an online theoretical class after placement hours and have their course and programs be attained within the given period of time. So COVID-19, yes, a challenge. But one is that loud and clear that a blended approach for teaching and learning can be done for any program that you have in your institution. Clinicians have started understanding that it is possible for them to be able to do this and the learning process continues to be excellent. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. Thank you, Professor. Um, that was really a good way to start um, your um, address because breaking those ideologies, the fact that punishment, for example, is a part of the way um, we socialize clinicians and nurses and so on, uh, in some ways, you know, you are not able to punish people online. And perhaps really this is forcing us to revisit those cultures um, and, and, to, and to rediscover ways in which um, students can still be accountable, uh, students can still be honest. They don't have to be beaten on the head uh, for them to be able to learn. The other thing actually that is happening in, in uh, skills labs um, is the recording of the simulations where the teaching faculty are recording those simulations and the demonstrations and making those videos available to the students so that the students can also practice at home. But I'm really, really very proud of the team and what they are trying to do to ensure that clinicians haven't missed a step in their teaching and that for our finalist groups, for example, we will be able to produce workers that are urgently, urgently needed by the government and by the country right now as we continue to, to see significant uh, um, spread of COVID in the community and many healthcare providers are being affected. So uh, we are grateful that our finalists are, are actually able to do that and our also on ongoing continuing students are, are able to do that. Uh, now, I would like us to <laughs> talk about another controversial issue. And this is really for both uh, uh, Dean John Bosco Alege and uh, Professor Okidia. 
um, cheating is very, very common uh, in universities and in schools. And in fact, the National Council of Higher Education was very concerned about how exams can actually be done safely uh, under quality control processes and how do we really mitigate um, uh, cheating? Uh, how do we establish honest cultures in online learning, knowing that this has been a problem in the face-to-face -face traditional approaches. So uh, any one of you want to take on this issue? Uh, what can we do? What are we doing uh, to minimize and ensure that the safety and the integrity of, a, of, a, of the exam uh, has been maintained? Uh, Professor Kiria Dinjon Bosco, either of you want to take this on? Okay, okay, let me take part of it and Dean John will do the other part. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. You know, a cheat is a cheat, whether online or face to face, a cheat remains a cheat. Unfortunately, uh, I hope it's not uh, dating back to be biblical times. Now, I, I think one of the challenges, one of the issues that CIU is championing has been training of assessor, I mean, uh, lecturers, teaching staff, faculty on assessment. And it's one of the reasons that CIU has pioneered a postgraduate diploma in medical education. This is the first postgraduate diploma private in Uganda. And it is a, was accredited by National Council of Higher Education. And one of the clear benefits of this program is really teaching the faculty on the aspects of assessment. The cheating can be done at all levels. However, the first aspect to minimize cheating is from the setting of the assessment. Once you have an assessment that is properly set, where people have to apply logic, reason, and analytical skills, application skills are being examined. The little space the cheater will have because he will definitely need to engage his or her mind to be able to um, carry out a logical reason to have an answer somewhere. But probably the challenge that comes online is that we could say that he could give his brother to do this. I think the online learning has got controls that can minimize these processes. And faculty is developing other additional approaches on this. Because if you look at the cheating scenario, there is also cheating of the students by not actually attending classes. They have put their phones on, but they're not participating. It's also a form of cheating. And so what are we doing? And currently, for me, I have created the, a WhatsApp group for my class. It's a WhatsApp group for shame. If I called you to ask a question three times <laughs> and you're not answering, I know you are on but absent. And I will post your name there that you are actually not answering. And people have called me back and say, Professor, save me. I was doing this. I will not do it again. So we are trying to minimize and make sure. Today I had a class at 8.30. It was amazing when I did it and people said, ah, for us, we shall not miss again. So we are trying to do an all around assessment, not to wait for a final examination. Because the final examination, anything can happen. But the most important thing is that assessment is good. But what is important is that we ensure that the learning process has occurred. And skills and competences have been gained throughout the process. And then we talk about this, which is the Ugandan system, where you have to say you have passed or so you have not passed. But we are sure that the modifications of all the types of assessment, the process of supervising, and all this will make this a better assessment for, the, for this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, I, I, the shame WhatsApp group. Uh, Dean John Bosco Alege. Anything to add? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, my colleague, Professor Keria. 
So one day we are having a chat with uh, Dr. Ian Clark in one of uh, our neat and great sessions. And we're talking about Ashesha University in Ghana, where uh, you write exams without individualization. So if the time for the exam comes, the exam starts at nine up to 12, the, first, the instructor will bring the papers, give to you and walk away. And for the entire three hours, nobody comes really to check on you. When you're done, you take the paper and submit. I was like, wow, probably this is the challenge that CIO has to move to the level of uh, Ashesha University in Ghana. That level of integrity to me is incredible. And uh, so why did I start with that? I started with that because at CIU, having ben benchmarked with some of the universities in the country, I think we are on that uh, path in terms of uh, our students taking it upon themselves that assessments are meant to establish whether they appreciate the content that they've been interacting with in the course of the semester, but it is not meant to either fail or pass, just as uh, my colleague uh, Professor Kiria was saying. Now, just before I go to supplement on some of the strategies we are using to check on uh, cheating and uh, uh, establishing a culture of honesty, there are several ways in which a student can, can cheat because right now the focus is on the, on the learner's side. Number one is to simply be lazy, run and pick someone's uh, essay, you know, change the name and then present this as their own piece of work that has ever happened. The other one is to go on the internet last minute, do an assignment in two hours and turn it in. That is plagiarism. The other one is hire an expert, quote, quotes, quote in quotes, and then and tell, do for them the piece of work. So if you call them back to come and explain just one paragraph of what they meant, they really struggle. So there are several ways. And, and, and the good thing is that the good news is that we are all abreast with those different forms, formats, forms, sorry, of, uh, of cheating. And so what, have we been doing, uh, what, how, have been res how have we been responding to that? Number one, I want to agree with the professor that our curriculum and therefore the way we deliver it is competence-based. So much so that if we give you an assignment, a take home, it is very difficult for you to go to an encyclopedia, to go to Google Scholar and download exactly that assignment and turn it in like what other people are doing elsewhere. Practically, it is impossible. And students have given us feedback that the problem-based learning approach blended with, uh, with the competence-based learning. And recently, moderator, you are aware you've been championing uh, trainings uh, by Professor Gray on uh, interprofessional uh, training. So all those have helped us to look at different ways of assessing our learners in terms of how they've comprehended uh, content that we're delivering. Professor talks about critical thinking skills, which is very core, as you're all aware. Ethics and integrity is a foundational, is a philosophy course for CIU, regardless of whether you're doing biomedical sciences, you're doing uh, public health, uh, bachelor's, master's, you're doing nursing, you do ethics at some point. And that is not just for time wasting, it is meant to work on a number of things, including issues of integrity, including issues of uh, reflective uh, thinking. Recently, when we did the first final assessment for the students, which was online, because our students were used to the standard three hour paper, you sit in a, in, in a lecture room in a theater hall, write the exam and turn it in. So this time the approach was different. As the dean, I got several calls from students, from sponsors, from parents, from guidance, apparently protesting that way of, uh, of assessment. How are you going to assess my student, my child, my, you know, online, and then how, how are you going to promote them or you just want to fail them? Again, the whole thing of change management. So I had to take time, write emails, explain to them that, look here, there are several ways of assessment. And this is one of the ways of assessing if the student, the learner really uh, was able to follow the discipline that um, uh, they, 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 they signed for. So again, that change of attitude that you can actually do an assessment online and therefore the student can still demonstrate that they have the, the, the key competences required in that program. Now, uh, again, this is not new and this is not just because of COVID. CIU, I think, has been the pioneer, if not second, uh, university to introduce the plagiarism software 
So this is a software, especially for graduate students, and I, even we had to roll it down to the undergraduate students, where once you've done, say, a take-home paper, 2,000 words essay, or whichever kind of work you've done, as long as it's in soft copy, you submit that software, and there's an acceptable minimum similarity index percentage that you need to score, above which that paper is returned to you, because what that means is it is not your own piece of work. And that was to promote um, integrity in terms of the papers that students uh, write and turn it, for example, uh, for, for assessment. It also is to train students on uh, writing skills so that they're able to write, uh, I mean, develop scholarly writing skills and be able to, you know, publish and, and write for, for someone out there to, to, to read. So the plagiarism, uh, plagiarism software has worked so well. And now with the Odell uh, platform, it is very easy because it's embedded in the Odell, it's, it's, it's embedded in the Odell platform. So when a student is submitting a piece of paper, they don't send to me as the facilitator. They have to submit it to the Odell platform and automatically it is checked for plagiarism. And so those are some of the things that we are doing now. It's work in progress because, you know, new things keep evolving, but also we need to be uh, abreast in terms of the new uh, strategies that we need to put in place to be able to evaluate and make sure that our students don't cheat, but importantly, develop the culture of academic integrity. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. Um, I like that both of you talked about uh, three key uh, issues. Uh, professor talked about really developing the whole individual. It's not just about that exam. Students are cheating if they, you know, turn their phone on and then somehow they are doing some other business and so on. So it's really about the whole individual um, and the ethics and values uh, that are, are critical for developing students as leaders. Um, then John Bosco, you spoke about, you know, being able to assess students for learning. The high stakes exam that come at the very end of a program uh, typically is not necessarily reflecting of learning because, you know, students can uh, memorize and regurgitate a great deal of that information back to you uh, without necessarily actually having learned that content. So I think that it's important for all of us to remember that. I think uh, one of the new things um, about the new uh, Odell platform is that it also has uh, a safe exam uh, lockdown browser uh, that uh, faculty can implement uh, to uh, also enforce um, students from uh, non cheating. I want to um, move back um, to Michael Nitegeka. Um, again, Refactory has done an amazing job in, in terms of this community to community and student engagement. What are some of the web conferencing tools that typically uh, universities need to consider, Michael, to be able to foster student engagement? I know that we use a few here at CIU. There are some universities that are looking to see, okay, what really works, what doesn't work, and what should we move forward? Uh, Michael? Thank you, Rose. Uh, before I answer your, your, that specific question, I also wanted to contribute to the whole assessment aspect, if, if you permit me. Yes, please uh, go ahead. So, so, so when, we, when we went online, um, we had a cohort that was about to complete and so the question was do we wait until they're able to come and do assessment and of course my colleagues were like people will cheat and i said okay supposing we changed our mindset and started asking how can i set an exam that even if you had all the resources required that the, the brilliant student will still be the one that is able to navigate the resources that they, they need to access and the one that has not adequately prepared, even if you gave them the whole day, they will still struggle. So, so how do we change that? And we decided to give them a practical assessment because after their three months program, they go through an assessment. And I said, give them an assessment. Let's think through an assessment that they have up to eight hours to submit. And let's see 
how many will say they even had the time to check Google, to check other lines of code and all kinds of stuff. And, and, and what happened was that when we looked at the assessment and also engaged the students, the, their feedback was that they hardly had time to look elsewhere. You either knew or you didn't know because going somewhere else would not help you quite a lot. And so one, one of the things, and I think uh, Ina Lege talks about it, what is an exam? What is the intention of an exam? And for us, when we got to realize that we are assessing skill, we are assessing competence, then we started asking, okay, must it be supervised? Must it be? And, and I can tell you, the only reason we bring them to now to physical space is the connectivity challenges that some have. But I'm also challenging my colleagues and say, okay, let's see if I give them the whole day. They have the opportunity to go elsewhere and find where they can find good connectivity and do the assessment. Now, of course, the guys who are scoopers will find maybe somebody to, to, to support. But you see, if, even if that person came to support you and has not been part of the class, doesn't know the structure, that person will struggle even if it's a, it's a technical exam and requires them, let's say, in software engineering, even if you know the software line or the software language, if, if you're an expert, you probably use a language that we don't use, and then we will get you there. So, so that's how we've managed to navigate that space. Um, it's a learning in process. I can't say we've gotten it, but the students get to know that they have to work for it. Now, what are the tools available for, for web conferencing? And so what I can tell you, um, Dr. Rose, is that this space is evolving very fast. And, and there are all sorts of tools that are beginning to emerge. I know, for example, the Ministry of ICT is supporting a team that has developed their own uh, web conferencing platform, and they're trying to roll, out, to, to roll it out to the public universities. It, well, what, what I'm trying to say is that the technology is not complicated. It's just that uh, it, many times it didn't make business sense for people to make the investment in some of these web conferencing tools. We are seeing big players like Google, Microsoft begin to occupy their space and want to take a share because they know for a long time, education is going to be digital. So Microsoft Teams is really doing a lot of work around, um, around education, Teams for education. Google is also under Google Meet and its integration in Google Classroom is also um, I think giving a lot of leverage in that space. So, so those are the front runners, but different universities also begin to build their own web conferencing platforms that, that, that integrate. So the, the frameworks are known, the technologies are known. What I can say is that even if, if CIU wanted to go into that direction, you can, but does it make business sense? Probably it doesn't make business sense. You're better off working with what is already available. The Zooms and uh, the like uh, have, have decided to change their business model and are also becoming quite expensive now because let's say Zoom for Education has changed their framework. They have only, I think they have for the basic account, it allows you only 100 uh, facilitators or 100 lecturers. If you're a big university, that is a big challenge. You can't do much. Um, it also assumes that you only have 100 lecturers. If you have more than, uh, let's say, 100 modules to run, you're, you're, you're cooked. You can't manage. You can't. You can't manage it. So, so, so for now, if if one is starting, I would say, I would start with Google Classroom because of the integration that you already have with, let's say, the Google Suite kind of capability. Uh, if you have access to Microsoft Teams, which is a lot of work uh, and you don't want to pay, I would go for Microsoft Teams because it also comes with a lot of functionality. More students can attend the, the platform and, and, that, and that helps you in terms of size and, and all aspects. So, so for now, um, it, it's working with what is available, Dr. Rose. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot that is happening in this space. I am pretty sure in the coming months, we're going to see quite a lot of platforms coming our way. 
there's I'm sure you've heard of Blue Jeans. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the Cisco um, Webex that, that that has been running for years, but they're also doing a lot. So so every company is beginning to realize this is going to be the next big deal if they're going to tap into it. Um, so I would say we keep observing, keep noticing what is evolving and uh, seeing what is working for us. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and, and really that brings me to uh, my next question, which goes to, to Sean Clark, because the, the perception, there is a perception um, that you know, e-learning uh, doesn't cost you know, much. Um, and this is a perception uh, for, from the students, is a perception by the parents themselves. Um, and yet we know that a great deal of investment in uh, enabling infrastructure has been done at CIU for us to be able uh, to do this competently. Sean, uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the investment uh, approach uh, for CIU and uh, what strategies uh, in terms of cash uh, actually have we undertaken to motivate uh, teaching faculty, to enable teaching faculty and students um, and so on. And um, the second question to you is, after you are done with that, um, let's talk a little bit about the parent in the classroom, the parent in the e-classroom, because that's your experience at Clark Junior School. How important is it to motivate the parents as well and to orient parents to e-learning so that they are critical stakeholders. So two questions, one is about the investment and one uh, is about engaging parents as critical stakeholders in e-learning. Sean Clark. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Um, let me know if I need to turn off my video, um, but we'll try. Um, yeah, yes, you're absolutely right. There is a perception that uh, e-learning shouldn't be expensive. Uh, that uh, I, from from the student's perspective and the parent's perspective, and that it should be uh, even free, perhaps. Uh, so basically, there is a reluctance to pay. Now, clearly, uh, in, in in private institutions, learning is not sustainable. Any learning is not sustainable unless there are the revenues full cost. And unfortunately, e-learning doesn't cost any less than than ordinary if it's done well. You, you still need a teacher to facilitate a class and you cannot have a classes of infinite numbers of students because learning will suffer in the same way that it does any learning would suffer. Assessment suffers, um, per, per, personal interaction between teacher and student suffers and so on. Um, and, and in fact, there's an additional cost. There's additional cost of data, hardware, training. Um, there's a steep learning curve for any uh, any teacher or lecturer who, who has never before engaged with a, an e-learning platform to then suddenly have to learn how to, how to actually deliver quality uh, teaching and learning uh, using a whole, in a whole different environment. Um, so, I mean, yeah, Sean, from. Can, can, can you kill your video? Sorry. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's a mass transition from uh, you last time you had the version and then you Google terms. So, yeah, so it has a right. Uh, through my first time. Um, sorry, Sean, we are still not able to hear you very well. Um, and I think he has dropped off the call. So we will um, go back uh, to Sean um, when he returns on the call. Um, we have about 30 minutes left of this conversation. I would like for our participants to start asking questions um, for the panelists. And as we wait for those questions uh, to come, um, I would like to um, talk a little bit about, you know, the technical mastery and the digital competences 
uh, that are required uh, of both students and faculty uh, to be able to operate effectively, to run virtual teams, to coach virtual teams, to train virtual teams, um, uh, as Michael started. And really, this is a question for uh, any of our panelists. Um, in terms of the technical digital mastery, uh, let's start with you, Professor Kiria. You, you've been teaching online for a long time. What is it that you needed to learn? to be able to operate. And, and then we will move to uh, uh, both uh, uh, Alege and uh, Nitegeka. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. I think, well, I have been teaching online for some time, for sure. Um, what was missing was to have the live lectures going on. And therefore, meaning that uh, I needed to have myself prepared to be available to have a virtual face-to-face -face interaction with my learners. Many of the teaching online that we had originally were that we would invite students for the launch of programs and the, also the, uh, the, the kind of uh, end of program uh, uh, activities teaching. And the students do more of the reading on the materials that were put online. And so, and of course, we keep on addressing the questions, the putting discussions here. But I think here, the, the challenge was now that you needed to have time and you needed to prepare yourself to be able to present like you are actually presenting in class. So when this came, it was like, I thought it was like as usual that I would put my materials there and then um, ask a few questions and move on. So. <laughs> I needed to refresh my mind, I needed to refresh myself, I needed to make sure that I have the MBs available for me. I needed to now demonstrate that I must present the teaching in the way I've been teaching with a face-to-face, not just dropping materials there and say, please read on. You get a topic and you drop 100 pages and see the facts are there, see how you can navigate them around. So this one called for an opportunity for me to be prepared to have an interaction with my learners. So skills building, CIU has been good at it. I, I must confess that you have been the champion on this. And we have, uh, even with the big titles of professors, I think many of us graduated at the time when this was not the issue. And of course, I'm one of the people who are hurt that you are getting online. <laughs> That's on a softer note. <laughs> because I needed fresh skills to match up with the task. So what do I need to do? I must then be able to live up the expectation of the current challenge. So COVID-19 to me comes with an opportunity for me to learn more about IT, to learn more about online teaching, assessments, online interactions, teaching and learning, research supervision. And so I think this is a good thing. And uh, I am actually lucky that I'm in an institution where management is interested in building capacity for everybody to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Yes, uh, the, the training has been mandatory uh, for everyone, including professors, because we, we recognize really that uh, we have mastery of learning and teaching in the face-to-face -face, uh, you know, traditional approach but actually when you know you you get to online doing student engagement designing courses for online delivery redesigning adapting courses and so on learning moodle for example you know that that's a new thing i, I am learning as well uh, other people are learning we are all learning together but that learning has to occur uh, for the students to actually benefit from lecturers and professors who are competent and have the technical mastery of doing this. Uh, professor, uh, uh, no, sorry, not Professor, Dean John bosco -Alege. what have you been learning? And I see that uh, Mr. Clark is back online, so we will shift back there to him uh, after uh, John Bosco. Oh, thank you, Dr. Ross, and, uh, for that question. Now, as an academician, as a researcher, as a facilitator, the starting point is that learning never ends. 
every other day, every other moment is a learning opportunity. It is also true that I started uh, facilitating courses online some time back. I've done that for a while now. I've attended a few. Uh, that time it was Skype. So, so people will even ask you, so what is the Skype? How does it work? I remember uh, one of my professors uh, supervising my work one time decided that I don't go for a physical meeting. We're going to meet on Skype. And uh, so we had to get used to that. But over time, uh, so... The first thing for me was to understand the interface. Initially Moodle, but now uh, Odell. The interface through which I am going to meet my students, which becomes now the actual classroom. But one of the things I have learned is that the two are different. So going to stand in front of a class with a whiteboard and a white marker is totally different from sitting either in my offices now or sitting elsewhere and run a virtual class. This is because I think the level of energy, and we will calculate that, that you use online is probably different from the level of energy. That has been my personal experience. It's different from the level of energy you put when you're in a physical class. And therefore, you need to understand in terms of how do you ration your time to make sure that uh, the same content you're delivering uh, probably in the next one hour is the same content you will have delivered probably in three hours or so in the, in the in the physical class. So that aspect of time management, time lag is very critical. Whereas you will wait for 10 minutes of, sorry, you'll wait for between five to 10 minutes in a physical class to start a class, you'll find that actually a virtual class may go longer than that because you're waiting for people to sign in. They could actually be around their gadgets, their laptop, their tabs, but they're just buying time. And you can feel the pain of starting a class of 20 students with five. Midway, you have to repeat what you did like, you know, 30 minutes ago, and that really causes back and forth. So again, it calls for, it calls for discipline on both sides of the student and the lecturer. So for me, the culture, one thing I have learned is to set that culture of time management. If the class starts at nine, we all have to sign in by, by 8.55 everyone should get on the platform so that actually at nine exactly we start. So to me, that was really critical. The other one is that uh, moving forward as a requirement, as, 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 as a critical need for the fourth industrial revolution, where we now have ICT sitting in between everything that we do, whether it is work, whether it is teaching and so on. One thing I've come to learn is that uh, this is not going to move away. Even if the lockdown is removed, COVID is done in the next one or two years, online learning, online work, online meetings are not going to go away because I think people are getting gradually getting used to it and becoming actually the normal. We used to, we, we now call it the new normal. It's likely to, to remain and stay as the new normal. So we should be prepared. At personal level, I am prepared for a blended approach in life, both virtual and physical. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dinaleke. Um, Sean, I, I want to come back to you so that you can finish your uh, thought um, before we start taking questions from the participants. I see that you are back online. Sure. Yes. Do you want me to ask um, the question uh, again? <laughs> repeat the question for me, Dr. Rose. Um, yes, uh, I think let's focus a little bit about the parent in the classroom because yes, <laughs> I think our, our teaching faculty um, and uh, we all forget that online learning, there, there's one opportunity that um, comes with that is that the parents are actually part of this experience. Um, right. And I know that they, it's true for Clark Junior School, but it's definitely true for university students as well. How do you manage that yeah. as parents, as stakeholders? Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you're uh, in in uh, primary schools and even secondary schools. We're completely reliant on the on the parents to be part of learning. If they're, they're a new partner, a new. Uh, uh, factor in this that's essential so wh whereas a parent could could before drop a child off at, at school and have no further role in learning other than maybe to support with homework now we really need them to help because if the if a child is left in a vacuum without a teacher physically in the room with them 
and if no parent is there with them, then they they will not be able to concentrate and they will not be able to focus and, and, and they will fall behind and they won't engage with learning. So um, we, add, we need parents to be involved. But the problem with that is then the parents, from the teacher's perspective, their class is full of parents. Now, it's quite stressful to be observed teaching um, by an adult when you're a teacher of children. Um, you know, that it's a normal part of, of professional development, but when it happens, you want to be prepared for it. So, so the idea of having every parent in the class as well as the children is, is, uh, is, is something that's quite difficult. And, and I, I think it's good to recognize uh, that um, for the teachers. Um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, so much as we do require the parents to be involved um, and to be supportive, it does add an extra element of stress uh, and, and um, it's very conspicuous for the, for the teacher. Um, but in, in terms of helping the, the uh, teachers to, to be motivated and engaged, um, it is important also to just to ha ha maintain community. So to have to, and it's quite difficult to do that. I mean, that's the biggest challenge with remote learning is everybody's remote, clearly. And so how do you keep community, a sense of community going? Um, well, you have, to, you have to do that by engaging people in which way you can. So with uh, online engagements, fun activities as well as learning activities, um, we, we just held a, a, a Christmas carol concert, uh, very short, uh, on Facebook Live as a, uh, as a school. Uh, events like this, it helps bring people together and feel like they're a part of a community. And, and that, that helps support uh, every member of that community, teachers, and parents and students. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think that, you know, both for children as well as uh, university students, uh, parents are critical stakeholders. Um, because I think at the university level, they are also asking the same question, is learning really occurring? Is it happening? So they are curious about what the students are learning. And of course, for private entities, as you mentioned before, Sean, you know, students have to pay. And I'm sure that parents are always interested in the return on their investment. How are universities creating value uh, for the money that is being paid for their learning? And we do have um, a comment from uh, one of our colleagues, Pete, saying that CHIP is not engaging. The investment required to engage individuals remotely and maintain fresh learning perspective is really significant. The question is, do we want to deliver simply a certificate or do we really want to help uh, individuals transform? And as you know, you know, the mission of Clark International Universities is to prepare students uh, for global leadership and for those students to be uh, catalysts for transformation. So if we are going to be able to achieve that level of transformation of developing the individual as a whole individual, as, as Professor Oklia mentioned, individuals that have ethics and values uh, underpinning that, um, as Dinalege also said, and also uh, Michael said, you know, like this space is being disrupted. A lot is happening in this space and we need to be agile enough to learn uh, what is new, what can we use and how can we use it efficiently. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are, are open for questions. Um, there is a question from Facebook. Uh, uh, Godo Hubbard uh, from Facebook is asking, where does e-learning leave clinical skills transfer? I think he did mention, uh, uh, he, he missed uh, the presentation from Professor Kiria. So um, I wonder if Professor Kiria, you can uh, re-articulate a little bit of what you said earlier in terms of those skills transfer the fact that you know students are able to still simulate um, and so on. Just a, a statement to address that uh, question from uh, Facebook as we wait for other questions to come in and also the panelists to have a parting uh, thought uh, for Michael, what do we need to drop, okay? 
what do we need to drop, forget it, and just move on with something new? Because I think education is really, uh, we are traditionally traditionalists and, uh, and we tend to adhere to those traditions of excellence that have worked in the past. What do we need to abandon uh, 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 going forward? Um, for Sean, what best practice uh, should we move uh, forward? Um, and so on. So think a little bit about that. Uh, Professor, uh, can you address uh, the question from Agodo Habert? Yeah, thank you very much, moderator. Well, like you put it that you probably she missed my presentation. Where does this put the skills transfer? It puts right into the heart of the skills transfer. We, we, we have now an opportunity to not just to have the students go into some of the labs in some institutions because I do supervise and regulate which are probably not able to give the skills that we're talking about. And now with online learning, we are able to get videos of simulating systems that are able to have students trained and observe procedures, which is of the current date need. This had been abandoned as an area for high tech. It's no longer high tech. Health needs keep on moving and satisfaction for quality of care is a moving target. The closer you go to it, the better skills are required. So we have to get into the new target of the health needs. And this is an opportunity for even institutions that had thought their one room skills lab was enough. Nobody has abandoned the skills labs. It's just rearranged in terms of smaller cohorts to have it. Placement of hospitals in hospitals continues for institutions and we're supervising all of them because part of the learning is that you must learn hands-on on the cases and coronavirus is one of them. So it does not remove you from the learning, the skills, competences and the skills remain more, even more so observed and more exposure through the current simulation systems that online learning has brought to institutions to adopt, to be able to share classes with even more advanced communities and settings where students can conference and be able to learn more than we are. We had been obsessed with the old ideology of the face-to-face -face with the little we had, but it's an opportunity to open our learning. So where does it leave us? It leaves us in a better position than before. Um, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Jude Fox, um, who is a, a, a participant here, is asking, what about managing the cost of data for downloading materials? How is that impacting students and families? Uh, Dean John Bosco, do you want to take this on? What have we done at CIU that is helping um, uh, to respond to this question? Thank you, Dr. Rose. So at CIU, when we are applying for ODEL, the Open Distance and uh, E-Learning that was uh, accredited, approved by National Council for Higher Education, in our strategy, one of the things we mentioned that, uh, uh, so one, having access to a gadget that then will allow you to get to the platform was critical. Secondly, a gadget without internet connectivity then would not help but on both ends, on the side of the student, but also on the, on the side of the learner, but also on the side of the teaching faculty. So we've gone ahead at senior management to approve some discount on tuition and fees to allow the student to be able to afford data every month for the entire semester. And this was based on some calculations. They may not be 100% accurate, but at least we did some estimations that if, we, if the university gave back uh, that discount to the student, the student should be able to afford data and be able to attend their classes without, without fail. Then the next question is what about on the side of the person delivering the course, the facilitator? Uh, senior management also went ahead and uh, we approved that every month all teaching faculty, whether you're full-time, part-time, for as long as you have an engagement with the university and you're facilitating teaching and learning, you are also being facilitated with data uh, every month for you to be able to prepare content and be able to interact with the students online. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but I think, Jude, there's uh, a bigger conversation mm -hmm. to be had here 
um, about data, um, about access, um, about enabling, um, because while CIU um, is able to do this, uh, I, um, I recognize that for majority of students uh, in rural areas uh, around the country may not uh, have the level of access and, and connectivity uh, that is necessary. And in fact, in our application to the National Council, we had to be able to demonstrate how else, you know, let's say, for example, a student does not have the gadget um, or the student has the gadget but doesn't have the network or the student simply doesn't have the gadget or the network and their pockets around the country, I believe, where this is still happening. So then what do you do? Um, and, and I think in that regard, then you are going back to uh, the traditional correspondence uh, learning where students have access to learning content, either in printed materials and so on, which means that they have to observe uh, standard operating procedures for COVID to come to the university to pick up uh, that, learning, the, uh, that learning content. But a bigger conversation really is about policy and regulation and how the government going forward can think about um, uh, establishing partnerships uh, with uh, the, the big hitters, uh, uh, the providers uh, of data and internet and connectivity, uh, MTN, Airtel, uh, and so on, to be able to provide opportunities for zero rated platforms for learning. I believe that that will uh, help open an opportunity, not just for universities and secondary schools and primary schools, but more importantly, for, for example, your rural healthcare worker who needs to have access to continuing medical education. And in fact, that's our next webinar next Friday. We are going to talk about what are the opportunities for e-learning for the practicing, for the practitioner, for healthcare providers, for the unreached healthcare providers, or those in hard to reach areas who still need you know, best practices, emerging information for them to be able to practice competently. Um, Robert Lubanga says that I think parents' involvement is key. I know of a parent in a remote area with no technology knowledge whose child has lied to him that for him to be able to learn online, he has to be near the institution because this child still wanted to get a hostel and the upkeep fee. <laughs> I am pretty certain that there are a great deal of that uh, uh, still going on. Are there other questions from the participants? We have some lecturers. This conversation uh, focused a lot on um, the uh, deans and the stakeholders and administrators, uh, but I know that we have lecturers and students online. What do you think is working? What do you think is not working? and what do we need to carry forward? As I wait for those questions now, I would like to go back to the final thought on the, uh, from the panelists. Let's start with you, Michael. Um, as I mentioned, what is it that the education sector completely needs to abandon so that we can make new frontiers for um, new ways of learning and disseminating knowledge and creating knowledge. Michael. Um, tough question, Rose. Uh, it would, <laughs> you can be it controversial. Would, <laughs> it, it would need, it would need uh, massive disruption. So the, the first question we really need to ask is what is education and when does education take place? And, and if we're able to answer that question, then you'll find there's quite a lot of stuff that we need to really drop um, in, in terms of these standards that have been set. Um, <clears throat> I've asked questions around master program take three years, must it take four years? What, what, what is the rationale behind um, some of the things? And what, one of the things we are learning from the refactory um, is, I mean, we're seeing people who come, have done music, have done art, 
and come on and become exceptional software developers. But in your traditional national council structure, those people will never apply to do software engineering because they are not science based, um, which, which is very unfortunate if I could put it that way. Now, but, but as, as we go to the future, Dr. Rose, one of the things that I think needs to be intentional is reskilling and upskilling of everyone um, around digital skilling, digital competence. Because you see, just because you have a laptop does not necessarily make you a competent user of technology. And, and, and you can see how people are struggling with very basic things. I mean, you, 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 you call someone and you say, okay, we have a, a webinar or we have a meeting. And someone tells you, I am entering Zoom. And you're like, where? How, which door are you using to enter Zoom? But, but <laughs> they're still stuck in the physical of I am entering a meeting room, I'm entering a boardroom. Now, it may not make a lot of sense, and, and maybe I'm over fussing, but it just shows you the understanding of the lingua that comes with the technology, the understanding of, of, of how to safeguard myself when I am online, the ability to realize that uh, whatever you once, you, once you go online, you, you, you're in the public space, and, and how do you safeguard yourself as a student, as a lecturer, as a researcher? The basic digital skills are going to become basic necessity skills now, um, if, if, if you had to ask me. So that needs to be emphasized. We also need to start thinking about what are the minimum standards, Dr. Rose, for you to become a, a, a lecturer from a digital competence perspective? Because as Dina Lege says, we're not going to run away from blended learning, but you also want to have efficiency. You want to have effectiveness. So what are those skills that are required for people to navigate this whole digital landscape? And the same thing needs to apply to the students uh, because we also take it, they have smartphones, but majority of them, you send them a, a calendar invite. They, they can't know how to activate a calendar invite. Now that's basic. You and I may look at it and laugh at it, but that's, that's where we are headed to. People no longer carry diaries, if I could put it that way. So, so that is going to be critical. Now, finally, you mentioned uh, for, from a data requirement, data management. I think as academic institutions, we need to carry out research. So Dina Lege, for you to run your class consistently online, how much data do you consume? How much data do the students require for them to receive? Because if we have data, we can now go to policymakers and say, this is what it is costing us. And, and, and if students are studying from home as opposed to coming to us, probably they are converting the hostel fees into internet data. But if, if government is going to negotiate, we need to find the data. So that's one of the things that I really want to challenge us to, to explore and say, do we have any data that we can present to whoever it is that, that shows what it is to go online um, and, and, and probably begin from there. But those, those are my closing shots, Dr. Rose. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Um, what critical, critical uh, that we, we present data for decision making uh, for the policy makers, uh, because I think that going forward, even for public institutions, you know, um, Makere, they, uh, I know they keep saying oh, oh, it, it requires a lot of investment for us to be able to um, invest in infrastructure, uh, to conduct exams online and so on and so forth. So it doesn't matter whether it's a public or private in, in, institution. Uh, we need to do this research. In fact, you are right. Uh, for Professor Kidia, for example, to do those simulations and for students to be able to download those simulations and to download the videos and to engage uh, fully online, you know, what is it costing in data for the lecturer and what is it costing in data for the students? We have made minimal um, enabling, minimal contributions towards this, uh, but we really need to know you are right. And I don't think that anybody really has an answer uh, right now. And uh, for folks like us who are engaging in online learning and teaching, I believe that this is research uh, we ought to do 
to get to that answer. And for us to become very strong lobbyists, we have a regulator here. Professor Kia is a regulator. What are those minimum standards? You know, how do we inform? How do we use the best practices and what we are learning to inform what then becomes a basic minimum standard for the professional councils to be able to regulate the universities? Um, I don't have any questions, so final thoughts. Uh, Sean Clark, parting thoughts? Um, yes, uh, I think if, if, if we're thinking about what we should be moving forward, what, what best practice we should be um, engaging with, uh, with remote e-learning. Um, one of the things that we have done from the outset as a, as a primary school is to not assume that everybody has access to, uh, to the gadgets and the internet required. And so we have um, tried to meet people where they are at. So what that has meant, um, learning. Uh, one is through Google Classrooms online learning. Uh, one, the, the parents knew how to use WhatsApp. There's no, there's no learning needed for that. It was a platform that already existed uh, that, that I think every single one of our parents had and for which the data costs were, were very minimal. Um, and then the third way, one way that we delivered uh, teaching and learning was by printing materials and, and actually having them physically collected. Um, all of those have uh, advantages and, and significant disadvantages as well, but it, it allowed us to reach every single one of our, or potentially reach every single one of our students in one way or another. We also kept our library open. Obviously, we had to apply certain SOPs, but we allowed uh, children to exchange their library books and walk away with and go home with their library books. And that's, I think, crucial uh, for, for primary and secondary learning is that reading happens, that, that children continue to read. Um, I think we have to look at the e-learning opportunities. What are the things that we can do with e-learning that we can't do in a, in a physical classroom that are, that are positive? And really capitalize on those. So apps and games, educational apps and games that are engaging um, and that are fun and interactive. Uh, interactive tests where they can sort of see where they've gone wrong uh, sort of in real time. Um, there's, there's some fantastic educational websites with, with that sort of uh, multimedia uh, approach to, to uh, teaching and to assessment. Um, we, of course, YouTube videos, there's, there's an there's a absolute wealth of, of fantastic educational videos uh, on, online. Um, and so those are really significant advantages we need to capitalize on. Um, and then move away from what maybe doesn't work so well, which is perhaps the didactic teaching where we so in, so try not to replace just the t teaching from the front of the classroom with a Zoom lesson. Um, that's yeah. helpful and it's helpful to ensure that students are engaging and to see that they're engaging in learning. But um, that, that it doesn't represent the entirety of what, what the teaching and learning is because it's not, it doesn't work that well uh, with e-learning. It's too easy to disengage, to mute your microphone, to turn off your video and to go and do something else. Mm -hmm. Those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much, Sean, um, how critical it is. Um, I think that even just exploring those opportunities, um, we've had a time where we were hoping we would go back to the previous traditional mode of learning. Now we know maybe there's no chance of doing that. So we might as well fall forward and explore all the available learning opportunities and then define what works well and what doesn't. Uh, final thoughts, uh, Dean John Bosco, um, before I go to Professor. Um, thank you, Dr. Rose. Again, there's no clear-cut uh, strategy. We'll just have to be combing things here and there to make sure that uh, they fit into what we would like to do. But first, learning essentially is, uh, is at least for the approach we use here, is uh, 
learner centered or student centered for that matter. But you realize that from the conversation we've had uh, since this morning, it is not just the learner, it's, it's a whole bunch of uh, key stakeholders the government, the regulators, the parents or the guidance, the sponsor, and then the facilitator. So there are about like six or so uh, individuals or parties involved to be able to deliver a particular uh, learning package. So what that calls from then is that there's, there's need to be a conversation among all the stakeholders to understand the new normal. Because, I mean, the students and the institution like CIU may totally understand where we're moving to, but if the stakeholders, including the labor market, does not actually understand what we are doing as institutions and the learners, time will come when they will say, okay, this was the cohort that learned online, probably at some point T. We are not sure whether they really have the competences that uh, they, they deserve to be able to deliver X, Y, Z. So my takeaway really message or what I would like to share with the audience is that let it not just be our journey alone, let's involve all the other key stakeholders who are critical, not, not just during the learning process, but beyond the learning process. The second thing is that, uh, again, the classroom. Uh, Michael talked about that uh, some, uh, a few minutes ago. So what, what, what is a classroom? Is the physical classroom the same as the virtual classroom? Again, stakeholders need to be able to to, to, to appreciate the fact that we are now moving to a new uh, classroom in the form of a virtual classroom that has the, has, the, has the infrastructure to deliver exactly what the learner could have received if they went to um, a physical classroom. Of course, that comes with a challenge, especially for us as administrators, as facilitators, as teachers, to be able to match up to the standard that the same student who went through this Odell uh, system is, is, is more or less or similar to the one that uh, went through the traditional system. So the classroom, can we all understand what our new classroom is in terms of, um, can learning take place anywhere now, not just necessarily, uh, again, whiteboard marker, 20 students in front of them and you're teaching them. My last thought is on assessments, that uh, I next time we need to be deliberate and they cause this buzz around uh, Ministry of Education regulators, or if there's a way this can get to the table of decision making. In terms of assessments, can we look at assessments differently now? For instance, the refactory program, I keep referring to it because I, there's a lot I'm learning from there, much as I'm a facilitator. Can we move away from the three hour standard paper that calls for just recording what you learned in the last three months and then bringing it back for assessment to where assessment is progressive. I know as CIU we have pioneered that, but can the regulators appreciate, Ministry of Education, National, National Council of Higher Education, appreciate that you can do an assessment for three months and produce a, 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 and develop a project and, a, and, and present at pitch camp and present your ideas as opposed to writing an exam in three hours and then we, we, we decide whether you have passed or you have failed. And that means a lot for your future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dean John Bosco. I uh, don't see Professor for his final or parting thought. Um, Professor Kiria, uh, has he uh, jumped off the line? Um, if he doesn't come back, I want to, uh, and there are no questions in the room and we are actually uh, past the time we agreed uh, uh, for this webinar. It was an hour and a half um, of engagement. I want to thank uh, all the facilitators, uh, Mr. Michael Neitegeka, uh, Mr. Sean Clark, uh, Dean John Bosco Alege, uh, Professor John Charles Okidia. Thank you very much uh, for being honest. There are just so many takeaways for us. Uh, things that we are learning, uh, best practices that we are developing, new ed educational norms, the critical needs uh, for basic digital skills for everybody across the board, parents, students, lecturers, professors, administrators, and so on, uh, thinking about uh, the minimum standards, championing uh, with the government and the regulators the ability 
to uh, enhance access to learning for every student in this country so that no student is left behind uh, engaging stakeholders, for example, in zero rating some of the learning uh, platforms. We know that it costs a lot of money to do good e-learning. Uh, and, and so the, the idea that it doesn't cost anything, I think that has been uh, made clear. We know that it is possible to train healthcare providers and simulate a great deal of what they need to do to be able to learn and gain competences and the skills that they need. So I really want to thank you all for being here. I see that Professor is back online. Professor, your parting thought uh, before I close the webinar. Okay, thank you very much. I, I went offline. So one is that uh, as a businessman, I see hostels becoming empty because uh, I think it's no longer going to be business. The government must plan what to do for us, the owners of the hostels. And two, there must be a discussion. As a regulator, all of you are aware, this may sound controversial, but the discussion must begin in these areas. Do we still need the tick box, the box to tick in terms of availability of teaching space? in the mm -hmm. National Council of Higher Education, Allied Professional Council, the Nursing Council, checklists. How relevant is the box of space? Can that be modified? A discussion should come around there. The second discussion that must come is the tick box of physical library. Now that we have students online and we have had universities with the oldest donated books hanging and spying big spaces in the big libraries. Do we still need to come and say emphasis, how many had the cover books do you have? If the students are going to be online and most of the learning process. The third one, uh, which is probably the last one is that um, the discussion should also come because this change has come. Institutions hire both full and part-time. What do we want to hire? Are we hiring skills and competences or you're hiring the persons to come, come and hang around? The discussions then must come around this area to see how then do we handle this in the current new normal vis-a-vis -vis what institutions are running in attempt to have to observe areas of efficiency gains and yet keep pretending to be having everybody full time and yet they could know for a given question they probably could hire a, a skill and a competence for the services required. These are areas that discussion should come around. But overall, I think it's very, very important, especially for the health professionals to understand and agree with me that the blended learning does not change the quality of the graduates that we produce. Instead, it will enhance the quality of the graduates we produce as long as we embrace this together and make this our new normal and our way of delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Such important questions uh, for us to take away with us, uh, for our participants to really think uh, about, and I really hope that uh, other stakeholders uh, within uh, the regulatory bodies are able to join part of these conversations that we are having at CIU because they are critically important in transforming the way we think about education, the way we think about the education space, the way we think about the lecturer and the professor, and the way we think about the student and the product that we are, are producing. I want to take this opportunity to announce that our next webinar is next Friday at 3 p.m. We are hosting uh, Mr. Timothy Mugumia of Last Mile Health, who in collaboration with the Ministry of Health has recently developed an application that allows healthcare providers to have access to continuing medical education, CPDs. Very, very important uh, for all of us. So I want to invite you again to join the CIU conversation on now how do we reach 
the qualified healthcare provider to enhance their capacity to respond to COVID, to respond to malaria, to HIV, and to make it possible for them to have access to quality learning. I want to thank you again, once again, our panelists and all our participants for being here. Senior managers at CIU, I see that you all attended uh, this conversation. Thank you for being here and for making time. God bless, look after yourselves, stay safe, happy Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Thank you, Dr. Thank Rose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, Pete. Thank you very much uh, to our colleagues in the UK who are on the call. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, thank God you. bless thank everybody. You. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we are going to end the conversation. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Yeah.